good morning, friends, and welcome to this Sunday's Meeting House live stream experience. My name is Chris. I am your live stream host, pastor, best friend, if you will. And we are hanging out right now in a park in Oshawa, Ontario, because I figure in a couple of weeks, it's going to get really cold. We're going to be wearing jackets. Uh, we're going to be living inside, indoors. And so while the getting is good, while we still can, why not spend outside in God's nature, in, in, in beautiful creation? The catch is, at certain points, there might be somebody walking a dog behind me. Just let it happen. There might be some kids playing soccer behind me. Just let it happen. Somebody might try to wave and hang out with us. Who knows? However it is, let's just enjoy the space wherever you're watching this. We're so glad that you're with us on this Sunday morning. And if you're on Discord, a big shout out and hello to you. We're so grateful that we have this Discord server that we're able to do life in beyond Sunday. It's sort of our lobby. It's sort of our hangout. It's the clubhouse. It's where we we're able to kind of do life together, share stories together, share recipes together, and do life in a really, really, really cool way. So. If you're a part of our Discord server, make sure to be active there. And if you're not, links on the bottom here that you can learn a little bit more about who we are and why we do what we do. And if you're on YouTube, say hello in the chat, talk about the nature behind me, all that sort of stuff. Even maybe this morning, talk a little bit about where you're watching the live stream from. And you know, this has been a busy week for, for our family. Maybe it's been a busy week for you because the week after Labor Day is always sort of the back to routine week. It's we go back to school for our kids. Some of us will go back to work because we're on holidays. It really is a lot of things happening. There's a lot of things moving for our family. We have a daughter who just started high school this past Tuesday. And I don't know if I've heard the words high school is the worst more than I have this week. And then our son, Liam, he is going he went to grade seven sorry grade seven this week and for him school is great because there's no drama people in his class and that's not him talking about actors he is specifically talking about people who don't cause trouble he's really excited about that what was this week like for you what was the routine like for you are you maybe you're 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 plugged into something like home church which you should be a part of we'll talk more about that at the end of our gathering maybe you're into volunteering maybe it's work. Maybe it's school for, for your child if you are a parent or a caregiver. Whatever the, the week has been like, why don't you put that in the chat? Let us know what this week has been like for you. And maybe even still, you can even put in what you are excited for for this fall. I know something that I'm excited for is this teaching series that we are in called Being Us. So we are learning about the value of being in this journey of Jesus together. And this week in our Being Us series, uh, Samuel and Quincy are going to be talking to us in a little bit about what it means to be a peacemaker, what it means to be somebody who practices nonviolence. So you want to stay stay in for that, and what it means to actually live a life of worship through peacemaking. Well, one of the ways that we're able to do that is worshiping through giving. As we give, we're actually able to help support peacemaking and nonviolent initiatives around the world. And also um, how we're able to do that also in our cities and our towns and online as well. So as you give, and you can give online at give at the meetinghouse.com, you are part of being a peacemaker, not just where you are, but around the world, which is a really cool thing. And that's a part of your worship. And as we worship with our giving, as we worship in community, through conversation, we also worship through music and song as well. And as we, we go into this time of worship, you're going to hear different moments where there's going to be moments of prayer and reflection. I encourage you, wherever you're watching this, in those moments of prayer, as Anna leads us, take those moments seriously. Pray those prayers with her. And let's combine our hearts together and maybe even combine our voices together as we worship. cold my friends but it's not even time change week good morning welcome we are so happy to see you this morning I was struck by something as we're gonna sing this first song in just a second there's something about starting your day in a space of gratitude starting your day in a space of gratitude of being thankful of why you woke up this morning of why you are here of why you chose to come 
to this church this morning of why you chose to come on time for worship. So before we even start, I want you to just yell out at me, or if you're on the live stream, type it in the chat, something you are grateful for this morning. Just yell it out at me. I can't hear you. You have to yell a little louder. What else? What else? Anything from, <laughs> anything from this side? Anything you're grateful for this morning? Yeah. I am grateful that you are my community this morning. And my hope is that as we sing, you realize that there is something about coming to a God with a grateful heart. That regardless if we are walking through a hard season, regardless if we are walking through a good season, whether we are coming in tired or feeling like it, when you start with a place of gratitude, your heart starts to shift a little bit. You start to be a little bit more present with what we're doing here this morning. So as we start to sing, why don't you stand with me? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this group. Thank you, God, that we get to worship you. And I just pray, God, that we would be so intentional to be thankful for all that you do for us this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See, I can sing a billion songs and dance till my feet are numb, spin till I'm empty and poor. I can't praise you enough. I can shout till my voice gives way, leap till I find no strength, lose my breath.
This'll have to do again. And if time were to stop, I could never tell it all. The words of you, this'll have to do. Oh, I just wanna thank you. I just wanna thank you. I just wanna thank you. I'm so grateful. Surrounded by your goodness, you have overwhelmed us. Hallelujah. Jesus, it's such a, a good reminder this morning that there's never anything we can give God that can properly say thank you that can properly, God, come to you and say, this equals everything that you've done and are doing in our lives. There's nothing that we can give, God. And in one hand, that thought can be overwhelming, but on the other hand, God, it's such a beautiful space of surrender to say, God, you already know that I could never equal this, and yet you desire my heart. You don't need it, God, but you desire it. There's nothing we can give God that could equal what you give, but you desire us, your kids. And so God, this morning, whether we come in this morning feeling like we have a lot to offer or a little to offer, we choose to give it to you this morning, to say thank you, but also God, to honor your space in our lives to honor the grace that you give, to honor the love, God, that you shower us with. We say, God, what we have to give, even if we'll never equal amount, the amount, God, that you've given us, we give whatever we have because you're worthy and because we love you.
Make this our prayer. Let's sing it out. My heart.
our hearts are yours. What a great place to start our day. To say, Jesus, you are the first thing that we want to see. You are what we want to look at. You are who we want to follow. Our hearts are open to you, to hear you, to go where you want us to go, to do what you want us to do. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, God, that when we truly look to you, everything else in life seems to take its proper place. When I was very young in my spiritual journey, I was in my early 20s, I um, had a pastor who would sometimes reach out to me and say, hey, if you're not busy, let's go out for, for a meal. Let's go out for a coffee. And I appreciated that so much about him that he would always reach out to me and always seemed to be at the best times. Somehow he knew. He had a sixth sense of when I needed to be uh, encouraged in a way. And the one time we got together and I had had a particularly very difficult week um, I was very stressed out, and I was glad that he reached out. So we sat down and uh, started to have a conversation, and he was so gracious. He just, you know, sat there and, and nodded at the appropriate time and was very, you know, very, very uh, did a great job of listening, asked questions to clarify things, and most of it was me just complaining on how, how difficult my life, I felt my life was at the time. Namely, I was frustrated because there were like... Uh, the, the, the traffic was bothering me for some reason, like more than usual. Uh, long lineups at the supermarket or wherever I was or, you know, the drive through it would just be agitating me to a way that was like, it was crazy. So I kept complaining. I said, you know, and then, and then, and then this is the case at work. Like they're treating me like I'm, they're undervaluing me. They're not using me to my full potential. And, and I'm just going on and he's just sitting and listening and saying, okay, yeah, very interesting and being so kind. And I said, and I feel like I, I've been praying more than I've ever prayed before more than I've ever prayed before. And he said, oh, okay, good, good, so kind and pastoral and gentle. And then uh, he, said, he said, Quincy, what have you been praying? What are the things that you've been praying? And I said, well, two things really, just simple. I've been praying for patience oh, yeah. <laughs> and I've been praying for humility. <coughs> and his response was very similar. He burst out laughing, like to the point where it was almost inappropriate, his laughter, right? Like more than he should. For a person who's like looking at, for pastor, for, you know, to be consoling and caring, like laughing right there in the McDonald's. And I, I think, dude, like I'm, I'm struggling right now. I'm having a bad week. And he said, how, how do you expect God to grant you patience? And how do you expect God to grant you humility without putting you through it? Hmm. And he said, There's, uh, th these are opportunities. You don't pray for a thing and then all of a sudden you just magically wake up and you have it. But God maybe is answering your prayer by presenting you with opportunities to build your patience and to build your humility. Mm. So, so I've, I've, I learned a valuable lesson that day, and I'm reminded of that lesson as we move into um, a, 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 a series of us talking about what it is that defines us, who are we, we're being us. And one of the things that we, we say often here is that we wanna be a church that's centered around peace and reconciliation. A number of people have been praying for this church in particular, for the meeting house, to be, to be <coughs> practitioners of what it means to practice reconciliation. We've been praying for that on a regular basis. And, and lately, my mind has gone back to that meal sitting with my pastor. Where I wonder if some of the things that we're experiencing may be an answer to prayer for more and more opportunities for us to actually practice ways of reconciliation and peace. So... Um, you probably noticed there's a, a, a very handsome gentleman sitting to my left. And, um, and one of the things about um, building these muscles is it takes practice. This is what it is, right? If you want to be someone who has an abundance of patience, abound in humility, it takes practice. 
practice being put in situations of having your pa patience tested or your, your pride put in, into, a, into a, a vice grip, so to speak. <clears throat> but it's important that in our practice that we actually practice well, hmm. that we practice the correct form, that we, that we practice in a, in a healthy way, right? Like we want to be able to, to do that. And that's uh, what's required in that is having the right tools. Uh, so Samuel is going to help us with some of the tools, but even on a very practical level, I want to share just a few things that we've got coming up in our community that will give people actual tools on how to, how to do conflict well. Another opportunity that's for our entire community that's available online for those that are um, uh, married, a marriage course that's coming, which is a um, uh, seven weeks, which will start the, the middle of October. Yes, October 16th, count out seven weeks from October 16th. Great, yeah. Yeah, so often conflict uh, is often experienced in close proximity, mm -hmm. right? The closer you are with somebody, the more opportunity there is for conflict. So um, not to say that this marriage course is something that just for people who are in conflict. I can remember uh, my wife and I, when we were doing um, premarital counseling, uh, everything seemed good in our relationship and we'd help young couples walk through and as we were doing it we would be reminded of some things that we were not applying very well in our own relationship. So, so a marriage course isn't just for people who are, are going through a difficult time but a good tune up, a good opportunity for, for just getting those right uh, tools in your tool, toolbox so to speak. Yeah. And on the screen there will be a QR code that gives you all the information about all that will be offered in the marriage course. Great. And then moving down the line, we have another course that we're offering for when things don't go <coughs> well and when we find ourselves in a, a difficult situation of marriage. Mm -hmm. So we offer a course called uh, Divorce Care, uh, which is a, an opportunity for people who have been through a divorce or even separation to be able to, to learn some tools and coping on how to, how to move forward, how to, how to be um, whole and healed mm -hmm. through, uh, for many of the most difficult and devastating times. So, so that'll start on uh, September 20th, and there should be a QR code that comes up even now that you'll be able to, uh, to register for that. And that's for everybody in the meeting house, right? The yes. marriage course yeah. and then uh, the divorce care as well will be offered. Yeah. Great. So these are some practical tools that we have that we can um, get in people's hands on how to deal with conflict. The hope is that all of these courses gives us an opportunity to not only grow in our journey with God, but grow in our relationship with one another. And specifically for the marriage course, uh, often people often think that, oh, my marriage is going well, so I don't need a marriage course. I tell you, I think every one of us need a tune-up. Just like you take your car every, every three or so thousand miles for oil change and the regular tune-ups, I think a good marriage often remembers to remember to tune up their relationship, to get a spark again in the romance. Go back to that early days when you say, I do. And so those are some of the availability in the marriage course. And it will be led by a couple of our pastors uh, along with me. Uh, yeah, so it's a teamwork, not just a, an individual running the marriage course. Great. <coughs> so Samuel, I'd love to invite you to give us maybe um, a, uh, a scriptural framework, mm -hmm. of some of the ingredients of reconciliation. Thank you so much, Quincy. Sure. Uh, so... Last week we heard a clear call to come follow me, Jesus. That was the chorus in my, in, as I drove back to, because I had to leave church slightly early to drop my daughter off at the train station so she can catch a train head back to school. So oftentimes every service we debrief as we drive back home. I asked my youngest daughter, a 16 year old, what did you hear from all this sermon today? Come follow me, Jesus. And I go, is that all you heard? She said, come, follow me, Jesus. I said, what else did you hear? And she said, he repeated, they repeated it three or four times. And so she played the same tune of come, follow me. And I think it is really interesting because Jesus invites us into this journey from the moment we accept that come, follow me. And he invites us into this journey, not just to be on just this journey between me, myself, and God, but Jesus invites us in this journey in a community. 
And he invites us intentionally so that we do this journey in community together. And we, I, as, as I will uh, try and unpack to us, uh, for us, what it means to really have some ingredients of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 uh, to 20. From chapter, uh, chapter 5, from verse 16 to 20. He says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regard Christ in this way, we do, no, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As an Anabaptist, reconciliation is at the center of our faith and practice. This means we take this passage in 2 Corinthians seriously. First, we recognize that we have been called to be reconciled to God. And primarily, our primary reconciliation is to God. And then our second reconciliation is to be reconciled to one another. Therefore, Christ calls us to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters. And not only reconciled to our brothers and sisters, but entrust us with the ministry of reconciliation. I know this is easier said than done. It is easy for me to say, why don't you just be reconciled? It is easy when I see two or three people having conflict that I can do, having some kind of disagreement that I can say, oh, why don't you guys just reconcile? I must admit, reconciliation is difficult and challenging. And above all, it is messy. Some of you may be saying, Hey, Samuel, are you saying I need to be reconciled with X? Whoever fits that X box. Because there are some people that we definitely think that to ever reconcile with them, they are the most difficult and the most impossible people to be able to connect with. But Jesus is saying, I called you out and entrust to you a ministry of reconciliation. So when we walk towards reconciliation, it leads to a restoration of broken relationships. It leads to peacemaking, and then it leads to the transformation of all things in society. One of the, uh, the people that have really impacted my life uh, in terms of my academic search and in terms of even my conflict transformation pursuit is John Paul Lidrak. John Paul Lidrak is an emeritus professor from uh, Eastern Mennonite University in, uh, in the States. And he wrote the book, The Moral Imagination. He described reconciliation as the capacity to recognize turning points and possibilities to venture down unknown paths and create what does not yet exist. This is an invitation to imagine in the eyes of faith, to step out in faith, to imagine what only through faith that you are able to see that brother, that sister, who have really, who you feel has offended you so much that there's no way you can reconcile with them. But the moral imagination invites us to think beyond the offense, the, the to whatever is causing the, the conf has caused the rift to be able to imagine them as my brother and sister. And most especially, when you think about eternity with the person you absolutely disagree with, that you're going to hang out in eternity with, <laughs> we better make that reconciliation work in this part of eternity. So uh, the moral imagination, Lidrak's view is that that possibility create, uh, allows us to create ways uh, to be able to venture where we as humans cannot normally know, uh, we, uh, not go. We live in a messy world filled with messy relationships. The church exists in a messy world, so we are not immune to messy relationships. 
Even in the messiness of life, God calls the church. God calls you and I as Anabaptists. Reconciliation is key to our faith and work and practice. However, reconciliation doesn't just happen magically. It involves a lot of work. It it involves acknowledging that a wrong has been committed and having the willingness to say, yes, God, I don't want to make this. I am not ready for reconciliation in my own human capacity, but by your grace and by your enabling power, give me the courage and the boldness to imagine a path that does not yet exist. When we intentionally seek reconciliation, it serves to show that God is at work in us and God is at work through us. Because naturally, our human nature will not allow us to even venture anywhere close to someone that has hurt us or someone that has done something that we feel we have been hurt by. And as a result of that, we will rather avoid, avoid, avoid. But just as we read from the few verses in 2 Corinthians, we are admonished to regard no one from a worldly point of view. Because before us, we may be thinking that person needs a lot of repentance. In the meantime, before God, they are all cleansed. Because we don't know the heart of people except God. So as we work to build this muscle of reconciliation and to equip ourselves to practice reconciliation before we can even show, I'm not asking us to do this to show to the world that, oh, oh, here we are and give ourselves a pat on the shoulder. But no, by demonstrating, by living out reconciliation amongst us, it would, the world will see because Jesus says, when you lift me higher, I will draw all men to me. So we're going to look at the story of, uh, we're going to read Genesis 33 from verse 1 to 15. The story of Jacob meets Esau. So that's going to be the crux of my passage that I'll unpack for us some of the steps that we can look at. What are some ingredients for reconciliation through the story of Esau and Jacob? But before we get into the story of Jacob, Isaac's family is a family full of drama. They have got all kinds of drama. I don't want to go into the drama of how Isaac, how Isaac got his wife, but imagine even as Isaac married Rebecca, and Rebecca now who is just pregnant and expecting twins, and even from the womb of Rebecca, these twins were already having fight amongst each other. Man, it never gets this deep. But the crux of the story is Rebecca is one of the women in the scripture that is regarded as a powerful matriarch. And why is she regarded as a powerful matriarch? She was regarded as a powerful matriarch because she's one of the women that spoke to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. The God that said to her, two nations are in your womb. And the older will serve the younger. So when we read through the providence of God in the story of Esau and Jacob, even though we know that story is sort of like, really, Jacob is a trickster. Jacob is just really a, one of those connivers who really figured out. You remember in the story in Genesis, I'll invite you to actually take time. I won't, we won't go through it, but I invite you to take time and read the story for yourself. Jacob took advantage of his brother Esau and asked him because Esau came back home one day hungry and firmish and really needing food. And instead of being a brother that is kind and caring, share what you have with your brother. He said, I will give you some of this. I'll give you this bowl of soup if you can sell me your birthright. He's already imagining what does not exist. And of course, Esau, out of desperation, out of a need for, I am going to die unless I have something in my stomach, sold his birthright. And so the story went on. And in Genesis chapter uh, 25 from verse 19 to 22, it tells us about the struggle. Can you imagine how Esau, who is an older brother, would have been felt by the betrayal of his younger brother asking him to sell his birthright? 
And it went on and on until the time that when the time for blessing, when Isaac was old and he's about to bless Esau. So he told Esau, go out and hunt a game and make me some delicious meal. And Rebecca, remember her conversation with God. And she tricked uh, Jacob into taking one of the lamb and making food for his father. And, he, and Isaac could say, I, the voice sounds Jacob, but the, the feeling, the hairy part is Esau. So I bless you. So he blessed. So Esau has been ripped off of everything you can think of. If there's any degree of separation, you will see that these two siblings have fought so over and over, and there has been distance between them since birth. I know there's no clear account of how much those two spend time together, but from the account of how I, if I look into it, I, this is conjecture on my part, is that it is possible that these brothers never hung out together because one is a mama's boy, one spent time out in the wild hunting. So Genesis 27 clearly tells us uh, Jacob is a trickster. So let's get back to our scripture from Genesis 33 and from verse 1 to 15. So Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him. Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around him, his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached uh, approach and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all, J- Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob, if you have found favor in my eye, in your eye, if I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the presence that, that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I will accompany you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord uh, Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewe and the cows that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let me, uh, so let my Lord go ahead and his servants while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds before me and at the pace of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir. Esau said, then let me leave you, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in your, in the eyes of my Lord. So I will attempt to unpack some of the ingredients of reconciliation in this passage. Because the ingredients are so simple that sometimes we read through this passage and we gloss through without paying attention to what, are the, what is the crux. The first ingredients that we find in this passage is, that is crucial for recon- the ingredients that we find in this passage that is crucial for reconciliation is trust, humility, generosity, Forgiveness and communication. So I'll unpack these ingredients for us one, uh, one at a time. Jacob and Esau's estrangement w- lasted for over two decades. So can you imagine you've had this conflict with someone and it has lasted for over two, 20 years. And so the distrust between the siblings had existed throughout their life from the time in their mother's womb, as we heard. So trust that took this long to build can be lost in a day. 
Whatever trust you have together that it's been broken, it is harder to rebuild it. But something happened here. Trust must be built again if a relationship is to be repaired. We cannot be reconciled when trust is not being rebuilt. The ingredients for reconciliation, the first ingredients is, am I willing, are you willing, like John Paul Lidrak says, to venture down the path, a known path, to chart a new path, a path of trust. So think about some broken relationship that might make it difficult to rebuild trust. Friends, family, co-workers, I believe God's grace can help us if we can only allow him to give us trust again. The second ingredient for reconciliation is humility. We can see in the same passage, Jacob took the additional act of bowing to the ground seven times as he approached Esau. Imagine these two brothers have lived as two different rivals. And all of a sudden, the trickster is coming down and bowing before his older brother. The offender is coming, or probably sometimes you are the offender. You choose to humble yourself. So Jacob humbled himself so that a true reconciliation can happen. Because true reconciliation cannot happen if all of us want a highway, my way, or the highway. God is counting on us to be humble in offering and in receiving. <clears throat> the third ingredient for reconciliation is generosity. Generosity is the flip sign of the coin of trust. When people are seeking reconciliation, if I am willing to be genuinely give of myself for the benefit of someone I've hurt, then the act will help us start rebuilding trust. We remember years earlier, Jacob had stolen everything that belongs to Esau. And it's all, it almost amounts to restitution or reparation, however you can call it. But gen the generosity, J Jacob wanted to show his brother that I am truly sorry and I'm willing to share all that God has blessed me with. Even though the proceeds of what I had today might be attributed to the blessing of my, of, that I have stolen from you, I am willing to be generous to share that with you. I'm not sure if Jacob knew how much God has blessed Esau as well, but somehow he felt obligated, not because God told him to, but out of his conviction to be generous. The fourth ingredient for reconciliation to truly happen is forgiveness. Jacob genuinely wanted brothers, his brother's forgiveness. And it appears that Esau was willing to forgive Jacob and reconcile. When Jacob humbly approached his brother, the scripture tells us that Esau ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. Can you imagine that someone that have hurt you and you have gone before God and you have dealt with it and you, you see that person and you run and embrace and give them a kiss? And I'm not saying uh, a, a, a brotherly, sisterly kiss. In the Church of the Brethren, I, the first time I attended a love feast, there was a holy kiss involved in the love feast. And bear in mind that uh, the Church of the Brethren in the U.S. is predominantly white. And here is a trickle of people of color like me. Uh, and by the way, in that whole, whole uh, first love feast that we attended, my family was the only family of color. And this holy kiss was passing around, and I couldn't, I felt like docking from the holy kiss. But I tell you, when genuine, when genuine forgiveness happens, you are able to genuinely hug and even offer a kiss. The last ingredients of reconciliation is communication. In, <clears throat> in their reconciliation, we can see the conversation playing out between J J uh, Jacob and Esau. Even after their tearful reunion and humble acceptance of each other's gift, Esau needed to understand why Jacob meant by sending all these animals and all these things before him. 
And Jacob had to explain to him because I have been blessed by so much. And then in the reverse, when Esau said, okay, I am going to send some, I'm going to leave some of my men to stay with you. And there was this conversation. So communication becomes the new pattern of relationship because now you have been reconciled. You no longer are going to just stay in your silo, but you try to communicate as clear as possible so that it helps. In the same way, those who seek reconciliation, who seek and long to achieve, to, to attain, to experience reconciliation, must be honest, respectful in their communication. Reconciliation means building a path forward. What could that mean for you and for me? What could that mean for us as a church, for all the brokenness that we've experienced in the last year, the brokenness and the challenges of COVID, uh, all the brokenness that the COVID, the challenges of COVID, mask or no mask, that has brought along with it. The question to you and I is, who do we need to make reconciliation with today? Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. He says, but I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of, of the council. But whoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Whew. That's tough. So the call to reconciliation is very paramount. There is a call for us to have imagination beyond what we can see. There is a call for us to have an imagination beyond what we can humanly attain by trusting God, that with, by trusting God to give us the wisdom, the ability to reconcile with even those that are our enemies. Love your enemies. And pray for them that persecute you. These are not my words. They are the words of Jesus. If Jesus calls me to love my enemies, what, am I, what about my brothers and sisters in the church? The reconciliation invites us to have the capacity to imagine ourselves in a web of relationship that includes even our enemies. The ability to embrace complexity without getting caught in the schisms of things. The commitment to a creative act, it requires us accepting the risk that necessarily accompanies reconciliation. My prayer is that we become the kind of church that is able to demonstrate to the watching world, not as a way of showing off that we have attained, but as a way of saying, we truly are Jesus-centered. We are a church that longs to model, that longs to live out the call in 2 Corinthians, that we understand what it means to be reconciled to God. Now we've been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation, and we will long for the Spirit of God to move in and amongst us. Holy Spirit, move amongst your children. Amen.
What a way to kind of come out of that teaching, reminding ourselves that we trust in God. And that song, the chorus, is based off of one of my favorite songs, church songs of all time, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. That this idea of like, as we get to know Jesus, we're getting a small taste of what eternity with Kim is like. And that's our story. That's our song. That's the life that we live wherever we are, as we bring peace to various places and spaces we go carrying the story of Jesus with us. What a great reminder for us as we hear songs, as we hear teaching, as we get ready to go into home churches this week to discuss this sort of stuff. What a good reminder for us to go into this week with, that we are carriers of the story of Jesus, this, and that we are peacemakers in the world that we are, are in. A couple of last little announcements for you as you get ready to go into your week. We're, we're always trying new things on the live stream. We're always trying new things, new innovative ways of communicating the story of Jesus, communicating music, communicating worship, communicating communication, I guess. Let us know what you think. You can email us at live at themeetinghouse.com. Not at live, but just live at themeetinghouse.com. You can email us there. Let us know what you think. Let us know if we should not be in parks anymore and if we should only be indoors or if we should only be in parks, even if it is raining or snowing. And let us know. We want to hear from you because this is your experience as well. This is about all of us together. So we want to hear from you that way. A couple of other reminders for you. Home churches, if they haven't started if they haven't started this week, they're going to be starting very shortly. And maybe you want to learn a little bit about ways that you can be involved in home church. It's a great space to be able to do life with people, to break down the teaching and to break down what it means to actually live these 
thoughtful ideas out in real time and in real spaces. So if you want to know more about home churches, let us know. Email us. And we want to make sure that you're plugged in, that you're in community with people, that you're in huddles, that you're getting to know that you are not alone in any of these spaces. We also have this thing called Wednesday Teaching Stream. It's like uh, uh, behind the scenes, the BTS, not the band. We tried to book them. They said no, maybe next week. But a behind the scenes idea of as we are building teachings, as we are building series, so maybe some things that maybe had to make make the cutting room floor because there wasn't enough time or some deeper thoughts or how the process was built. We want to make sure that you're there for that. So that's the Wednesday teaching stream. We look forward to seeing you there. And then lastly, once again, as we leave here, we go into the lobby, which includes our Discord server. We look forward to seeing you there to do life with one another, to build relationship with one another until we're together again next week. Well, this has been a blast. It's always fun to hang out with you. I'm going to go see if someone's playing soccer beside me, and I plan to score 15 goals and then go back to my house to hear about how high school has been the worst for my daughter. It's probably not that bad. Hopefully, you're having a great Sunday, and hopefully your week is even greater than this Sunday has been. Blessings, friends. We'll see you again soon.